Okay, so again, welcome to our webinar tonight, Pushing Back Against Aging. It's uh, our new series, and this is episode one, if you will. Um, we're going to be talking about blood sugar and weight loss. My name is Mike Ventresco. I'm uh, one of the owners of Vital Choice Health Store North Royalton, and I'm joined tonight by registered dietitian Nicole Gould. Hi, Nicole. Hello. Uh, yeah, and before we get started, I just wanted to say real quick, um, thank you for joining us. Uh, if you've never been into Vital Choice before, or if you have, um, either way, I always like to say um, what we really try to do is from the beginning when my brother and I started open the store, our focus was on two things, really one mission, help as many people as we can get and stay healthy. But to do that, we felt we needed two things. We needed really good products that are going to help in that way. But also, we need to be a community resource to provide the information and the education so that people can know what they're, you know, what they're looking for. Um, and there's so much in the way. Since our store opened in 1998, there has been such an explosion of information available, but sometimes that information is not necessarily credible. Uh, and so our goal is to provide that. And that's, you know, what we're doing tonight. And, and Nicole has been with us at Vital Choice now for, Nicole, what is it? It's in the teens. Yeah? It's, is it 15? It's something, I have to check the books. Uh, <laughs> she, Nicole has Think been with us in some, some form or another for so long that she's been with us longer than Vital Choice existed without Nicole. So uh, I, I'm going to turn it over. She's a wonderful addition to our staff. Um, she uh, helps with our education and she does these webinars with us now. So it's, it's great. So I'm going to get my camera off and I'm going to turn it over to Nicole and I will be back. Whoops. And I will be back a little bit later uh, to, uh, to wrap things up and go over the questions with you. So Nicole, it's all yours. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome everyone. We're going to talk tonight, as Mike mentioned, about pushing back against aging. And um, this is such a important topic. I do want to mention real quick before I dive in is just please treat this as an educational webinar. And if I talk about supplements, if I talk about different physical activities and different diets, please make sure you're checking with your specific health practitioner just to make sure you're safe in making a lot of these changes. So what is aging? What does that actually mean? I think we, we when someone says aging, at least I maybe, I don't know why, but maybe most people think about like skin issues, like aging, I see wrinkles, I see more sagging skin, um, but there's a, definitely a more biologically affected part of us, this, this impact and cellular damage that happens over time that then leads to a decrease in mental capacity. Our brains don't seem to work as well, as well as physical capacity. Things are harder to do. Um, and and you, with this also comes a growing risk of chronic diseases. But the interesting thing about aging is that there are many ways that you can push back. And it was, I should have, I wish I could have figured a way to insert this clip, but I was um, on Facebook the other day and in the ads, this video of this 91 year old woman popped up and she was doing gymnastics. She is 91 years old and she was on parallel bars. She was doing the balance beam and she was doing, you know, she wasn't doing double backflips but she was doing handstands and her balance was beautiful. And she was, she had strength. She was actually holding herself parallel and I couldn't believe it. And then I thought, you know what, this is exactly what I'm going to be talking about tonight is that you don't just have to accept these thoughts that, okay, yeah, I, I don't, I'm not going to remember people's names as well. My brain's not going to be as sharp. I'm not going to be able to do the same things that I could 10, 15, 20 years ago because I'm older now. That number, that aging number is kind of a loose, uh, loosely tied to our actual biological aging. So again, there are things we can do, just like I have this apple on the screen. You know, you rub one side with, with some some lemon and it preserves that apple. It keeps it from becoming damaged and old. And just like that, there are things that we can do to really push back against aging. That said, there are many things that are accelerating aging, that are speeding up this aging process. So lack of exercise, poor sleep, toxins that we're exposed to, whether it's toxins we're choosing to expose ourselves to, like smoking and alcohol, or environmental toxins that we may not be able to help. Certain medications, 
stress. I'm going to touch a little bit on stress tonight. Inflammation is a huge part. And then tonight I'm going to specifically focus on high blood sugar, obesity, and poor diet. And it's going to be just a big cycle that I'm going to continuously uh, talk about each of these because it's like a chicken and an egg situation that you'll see if it's it's about breaking this cycle because they all kind of lead into each other and really speed up that aging process. And that is what we do not want. So let's talk about blood sugar for a minute. I'm gonna do a little bit of a deep dive. I'm gonna give you guys a little bit of a insight into what's actually going on. And this, this is important to understand when we talk about then ways to fix it. So blood sugar is the amount of sugar or glucose as it's also known, in the blood. So that's okay, but what happens, what needs to happen very quickly is that that sugar, that glucose needs to get into the cell. So in the blood, we don't want it there for very long, if at all, because it causes damage. It causes a lot of uh, negative reactions. So what we need to do is get that sugar to get into the cell, and then it could be used for energy. That happens with a hormone called insulin. Um, insulin acts like a key um, that really helps to get that sugar into the cell. I'm gonna to touch more about insulin in a few minutes, but I just wanted to kind of uh, let you know that that's a process that needs to happen. If sugar does not get into the cell to be used for fuel and energy, it gets stored as body fat, it accumulates in the blood, which contributes to plaque, and not just plaque in our arteries, but plaque in the brain as well. It can, it can contribute to that and cause a lot of damage with brain issues. It fuels inflammation. Inflammation is related to over 80% of chronic diseases from arthritis and osteoporosis to heart disease, our number one killer, to certain types of cancers, to dementia and Alzheimer's. It is so prevalent in the diseases that we tend to die from and suffer from in this country. And blood sugar, having high blood sugar is a major, major problem that we are facing. Why is this a problem? Because of this blood sugar roller coaster. So let's talk about this for a minute. So what happens, let's look at this red line here on the screen. So what usually happens is eat a carbohydrate food. And let me be really clear, this happens with a healthy carbohydrate, like an orange or a banana. And it also happens with a negative, you know, more processed carbohydrate, like a donut or a piece of candy or something like that. What happens though, is the more processed and the higher sugar the food, the bigger this spike. So you eat a carbohydrate and you see my little roll. It's the closest thing I could find to a little roller coaster vehicle. So, um, so you see, you could eat carbs and that will lead to an increase in your blood sugar. So what happens then is, is the body then sends all these signals like, okay, we're getting, we're getting higher blood sugar. It's going up and up and up and up. And then the pancreas has to make that hormone insulin so that it can help unlock that cell to get the sugar in. And the higher the spike, the more blood sugar is in our blood, the more sugar is in our blood, the more the pancreas has to work to put out more insulin. It's like it needs more, it needs more. And then what happens once that puts out all of that insulin is now we've got this crash because so much insulin is circulating, so much of it is, is then now driving the sugar into the cells, that now the sugar drops and now it's too low. This is that afternoon crash you may feel. This is that feeling that if you're someone that's relying on soda drinking or your coffee with some sweetener in it or going to the vending machines or maybe you have a little candy dish, that, that's happening a lot for, for someone that's doing it. Maybe reaching for crackers or cookies midday you get that little bit of uh, energy boost, but really the sugar is just spiking and then you get a crash. The adrenals, which are, are sit on top of our kidneys, these are responsible for putting out our stress hormones, which is completely tied in with blood sugar. So the adrenals start screaming, okay, all systems go. Now we gotta rev things up again. So it starts putting out this stress hormone cortisol, which cortisol has its own negative 
process. And then you kind of, you eat again and it drives the sugar back up. So it's, it really is like this roller coaster effect that happens when we are eating carbohydrates. And again, could be good carbs, could be bad carbs. We are eating. Hi, everyone. I think Nicole's having some technical problems. Nicole, are you? Uh-oh, she's having some technical problems. Well, I'm sorry. She's coming back on board. One second, she says. Think, I think we have a little snafu at least once every, uh, every webinar we do. Um, so in any case, I'm sure she'll be back up in just a second. So <laughs> please stick with us. Um, let's see. Nicole, did you need me to share the presentation? I'm so sorry, everyone. My phone just shut off. I think it did this last time too. Can you guys hear me? I can hear you fine, yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, apologies. I will put my PowerPoint back up and we will continue on with our blood sugar roller coaster. Okay. Okay, so I gave me a little bit of a heart attack. So thanks, Nicole. I'm gonna, I'm gonna back out again, everyone. <laughs> sorry. Something happens with Zoom. It just like completely crashes my system. So, all right. So that's that's the negative reaction of blood sugar. So um, what a healthier blood sugar kind of curve looks like is more of this green line here. This is where it's more of a hill. Of course, if you eat any sort of carbohydrate, there's going to be a little bit of an increase of sugar in the blood. But if you don't, if you have more of a complex carbohydrate, which I'll talk about a little bit later, what that means, like a whole grain, a bean, a legume, a uh, vegetable that has a lot of fiber in it, that helps so that it doesn't shoot up. It's not like that roller coaster. It's more kind of like a rolling hill. So the pancreas doesn't have to work as hard. It doesn't require as much insulin to be put out. And then the adrenals stay calm, blood sugar stabilizes. You feel more even in your energy rather than feeling those ups and downs and crashes. So here's just a nice little visual when I was talking about insulin of really what that looks like. Insulin, think of it like a key, okay? We have all these channels on our cells, all these places that glucose could enter, but it can only enter once that key is turned, once that, that lock is open. And the problem is when we have a lifetime, when we have years and years, not even a lifetime, because this is happening in kids. So a few years of eating your standard American diet really causes this key to kind of get rusty, you know, and that lock gets rusted out. And eventually, every time you do it, every time you use that key, it wears it away a little bit more and a little bit more. So at one point, that insulin does no, doesn't work. It's like the key cannot unlock the cell. That's like crisis mode because now the glucose is staying in our blood and it's just wreaking havoc. Sugar that stays in our blood then causes a lot of damage. That's why you see people that, are, uh, that have blood sugar issues, their vessels start to become damaged. Maybe their eyesight goes. They have increased risk for heart disease and stroke. Um, they have limb issues. Extremities start to... Um, start to see dead cells and dead tissue there um, to where some people need amputations. And that is just because we are insulin resistant. And so many people are insulin resistant. And I want to be super clear when I say this, you do not have to be diabetic to have a blood sugar issue. And um, I know this now more than ever because um, we test people and I see their numbers and we, we do deeper level testing. And I'm going to show you some of those numbers that you should ask your doctor for. Um, but in seeing a lot of those numbers, we're, we're catching it earlier and earlier. So people can really push back against this. And that's, we want that key to continue to work. It's a really important thing that the body stays sensitive. If you are insulin resistant, 
if you have high blood sugar and it can't get into the cells, that leads to obesity because again, that, that cortisol is pumping out that stress hormone that causes a lot of storage. It's like the body is saying, hey, you're, you're in, going into starvation mode. It's fight or flight. We've got to hold on to the weight. And it's like this cycle of you can't really get out of it. Insulin resistance is an independent risk factor for dementia, for Alzheimer's really. Um, independent of genetic factors, independent of other things, insulin resistance is its own major risk factor for someone developing Alzheimer's. Heart disease, it also can be a huge risk factor for that. Um, NAFLD, that's non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That is the number one liver disorder in this country, not alcohol. I know we have a lot of people that come in and want to talk about liver and they, they get really nervous that I'm going to think they're an alcoholic, but I know it's not alcohol. It's probably carbohydrates and sugar and insulin resistance that's now causing problems in the liver. And then of course, diabetes. If, if you continue to become and, and stay in an insulin resistant state or a pre-diabetic state, which is another word that, you know, or borderline diabetic. If you hear, if your doctor has ever said any of those terms to you, that should be like a huge wake up call. And really, um, it's a great thing to be in that place before it, you're told you have diabetes because there's so much you can do. It's a lot you could do once you get diagnosed too, but there's so much you can do to really fight against it. So it never becomes a major chronic illness like a type two diabetes. So insulin resistance is a big deal. By the way, all of these conditions also are related to aging and, and accelerated aging. We want to keep these cells healthy. And the way to do that is to pay attention to blood sugar. So I mentioned lab testing. Um, I, I think this is really important to look at and also pay attention to my numbers that I have on the screen here. Because another thing I find is that different doctors, different medical practices have different numbers and they sometimes aren't as uh, restricted or I don't know if restricted is the best word, strict as far as what they're listing as they really should be because more people are, are going over that number and so they're kind of allowing for it. And no, we know that when these numbers, when a fasting blood sugar is higher than 95, 99, that is your borderline pre-diabetic state. And if you don't get out of that and push back against that, you're on that trajectory to developing um, more chronic diseases. But more important than fasting sugar, because that is the one that most doctors will look at. You can have a blood sugar issue, but your fasting sugar looks normal. So what you need to also have tested is an after meal, a postprandial blood sugar. This will tell you how your meals are, are how your blood sugar, how your blood is reacting to the, the meal that you ate. How much sugar is staying in the blood after you eat a meal? That's such an important, valuable measurement. Ideally, you get one of those little monitors that they sell at the drug stores and you test this yourself and kind of monitor over the course of a few weeks and test it fasting in the morning, test it maybe an hour or two after a meal, and do that a couple of times a day and see what your readings are. Are they less than 120? Or are you having numbers that go to 200 or 190? That's, that's a blood sugar issue. Hemoglobin A1C is like a history. So that's a great one to get tested. That's one that you will not usually have tested unless the doctor has seen that your fasting blood sugar is high or unless they suspect it typically. But I know more functional medicine professionals and more doctors are, are really looking at that because it can show you that balance. Is it a roller coaster? Is that number high or is it low? We want it lower. And many people say seven or below. We have seen issues at 5.6 and above. So we want to get that number down even more. Why? Because that's where we see issues with dementia and brain issues and accelerated aging. So keeping that hemoglobin A1C, that, that history, for about four to six month history of your, your blood sugar uh, balance. Fasting insulin is another one. Again, that is an independent risk factor for brain issues. So we want to make sure that that's being looked at, how much insulin is being put out. So I just wanted to, to let you know that there are more deep level, if you're really concerned, um, 
when people are on this seminar, usually you guys are the ones that are already like really proactive about this stuff. It's the other people I should be reaching, but um, I'm happy to share that with you and, and see if that would maybe provide a little more insight into your own health. So again, I mentioned this cycle. So aging, the, the older we are, the more difficult it is to lose weight, right? The more we weigh, the more accelerated our aging is. And then the more insulin resistant we are and the more insulin resistant you are, the harder it is to lose weight. So you can see it's literally like this cycle. I kept like getting in this, this vortex when I was making this presentation and I was like, I don't know where to start because it's, it's so connected. It is something that we have to just pay so much attention to and break this cycle at some point. Um, wherever you want to start it at. But a lot of the therapies, a lot of the things you can do with diet and lifestyle are going to benefit both blood sugar balance, aging, and obesity. So it's like a win-win-win um, when you do some of the things we're going to talk about next. So I love this visual because this is like what I do when I go to the grocery store. It's like, you know, we go through the produce section and then it's just aisle after aisle of this stuff. It is just processed food. And um, it's tough because I know there's a lot of people that really want to eat better and they thought they were eating really well. And it turns out that the foods they were eating were being marketed and being kind of tricking them into thinking they were so healthy. But also it's really hard to kind of not eat these foods because there are scientists that work at these companies. Uh, these companies are really smart. Um, so they know the exact like pleasure centers of the brain that gets turned on by eating a certain combination of sugars and fats and other food chemicals. And they do that to continue selling their product to get you in an ad addictive state. So we've got to, to fight against these processed foods as much as possible. And these are the obvious foods. So the sodas, the cookies, the candies, the pastries, the whole bakery section. And then you go in and there's a whole aisle of crackers. And then the next aisle is just chips. It's like all, you know, we don't have enough flavors. We need entire aisles. Then you go over and it's the crackers and the cereals. So it's like aisle after aisle. What do we see on television? If you're watching a show, the commercials are for processed foods. You don't have kale commercials. I wish. Maybe one day I'll make a, a commercial for, for kale and uh, it'll get people to want to eat it. I doubt it, but I could hope. But this is what we see. So it, it's so important to kind of fight back against it. I want to go back um, just to point out some other things. So it's not just these obvious culprits like the donuts and the fast foods and the processed meats, but it's things like cereal. Cereals are some of the most processed foods, especially the ones marketed to kids. But even, even older adults, um, we're really getting duped into thinking that's such a great healthy way to start our morning. But if you actually read the labels, one of the ingredients that's first is going to be some sort of sugar high fructose corn syrup or, or honey or something that's going to be a really big spiker of blood sugar and a really big causer of insulin resistance. So we've got to be smart. Granola bars, people think they're so healthy eating their granola bars and most of them are just highly refined sugars. So processed foods are these multiple ingredient foods that come in a package, a box, Anything that you really don't have to do much preparation to, that's a processed food. So I'm not talking about, I know like rice comes in a package and oatmeal comes in a package. That's not what I mean by processed food, as long as it's the one ingredient. But like a Quaker Oats peaches and cream flavor that's got sugar and artificial flavoring, that's a processed food. But the steel cut oats you're buying and hopefully buying and making for breakfast, and then you can add things to, that's not as much a processed food. And then we've got the sugars themselves, cane sugar, brown sugar, powdered sugar, of course, high fructose corn syrup is like the worst, honey and maple syrup. I almost always have a question on honey and maple syrup because they are natural. So we interpret them as being um, helpful and, and not having the same uh, impact but they do. Honey will spike sugar faster than just about anything else. It is one of the biggest spikers. 
I know it's natural. I know honey has some benefit to it. If you get a good um, organic raw honey, I know Vital Choice, we have the Schmidt uh, Family Farm, which is a, uh, a local Medina honey, which is wonderful. But to me, that type of food should be reserved for like, oh, I feel like I'm sick. I'm getting a sore throat. I have allergies. Um, that's when you could utilize something like honey. But to just take it by, I have clients that just take it by the spoonful because they feel like, oh, it's so good for me. It's natural. It's got some enzymes in it. But yeah, it also has a ton of sugar. So if that's, if that's your only source of sugar in a day, that's probably okay. But what I find is you've had you know, cereal in the morning or a bagel and cream cheese, and then you're having some coffee or tea with some sugar in it or, or some honey in it, then you try to go out of your way to get more honey in or maple syrup because they're natural. And then you have the crackers and the chips. So you just have to watch in your day, can I balance this out? If I really like it and honey is meaningful to you, then you could have it, but just see if there's somewhere else in the diet that you can decrease. So let's talk about weight loss then. So this all is connected. And if you're insulin resistant and if you have problems with blood sugar, it's more difficult to lose weight. And I talked about breaking that cycle. So where can you start? The number one nutrition tip I can give anyone is to get real, meaning get real foods, whole foods, one ingredient foods. What does that mean? That means your vegetables, your fruits, that means your nuts and seeds, that's your beans and legumes. That is your one ingredient foods that are so important to our health because they contain all the nutrients, all the nutrition. You're not, you're not only getting bad stuff in this processed food, you're not only getting chemicals and sugars and highly refined carbs and fats, but you're also not getting anything, giving anything that's beneficial. And Whenever I talk about nutrition, I just like to remind people that every single thing you put into your body is either helping you or harming you. There's really nothing neutral. So think about your day and think about how many processed foods you're having that are just driving inflammation and disease. Um, and we want to stay away from that. So one thing you can do tomorrow or the day after is just write down what you, you normally eat or write down that day's um, diet and, and include your beverages. And then after a couple of days, look back at that and cross out or highlight or whatever, anywhere that there was a processed food, anywhere that there was a pre-made, pre-packaged food and see, do I have more real foods or do I have more processed foods? And that's a great place to start that doesn't take a ton of effort and a ton of work. Let's take a look at our, our sad diet here. We, we have a lot of uh, kind of white bland foods. Um, you know, your toast, your bacon, your eggs, your cereals in the morning with your coffee, your yogurt. And yogurt can be very processed, especially the brands that are really like desserts. There's so many, such high sugar. I, I've seen many that have just as much sugar as a can of soda. Um, we've got our peanut butter and jelly, you know, American staple on white bread. We've got chips as a snack. We've got chicken and, and potatoes and our little iceberg salad and corn and pasta and meatballs and some vanilla ice cream. And it's like, when I look at this, it seems extreme. And you might be thinking, well, I don't, I don't eat quite that bad. I have a few more vegetables, but this really is pretty representative of what most people are eating. And this is what we need to get away from as much as possible. Because when you look at this, first of all, most of these foods have been processed. Most of these foods are refined. And where is the nutrition? Where is the thing that is supposed to be helping our weight, keeping our blood sugar down and helping us from aging more quickly? If you don't have nutrients in your system, your body doesn't have much to work with and doesn't have much to defend against some of those accelerators, those toxins and other things that are really just fueling the fire of accelerated aging. So what could it look like? Um, I purposefully picked these foods because I wanted to show people that healthy eating does not have to be complicated. These are foods that don't take much efforts to prepare. 
So, you know, you've got, you could have a hard boiled egg and some avocados for breakfast. There are some oatmeal, and instead of sugar, instead of that brown sugar that, that we like or maple syrup, let's just throw on some frozen wild blueberries. Um, I know we have those wine, that Wyman's brand that people love. It even turns things kind of purple, so it's fun for kids too, but that's a ton of antioxidants. And it's naturally sweetening the oatmeal rather than the shock of let's start our day and just start that roller coaster. Let's just rev it right up and spike it right up. Um, green tea, we're going to talk more about green tea and weight loss, but green tea is very anti-inflammatory, it's very anti-aging, and it's good for blood sugar, provided that you are not adding honey and other sweeteners to it. For a snack, one of my favorite snacks is just to grab some good organic berries and some nuts. I like pecans, I like almonds, I've been doing some macadamia nuts recently that are delicious, and you can make your own trail mixes. I know that's another thing I love about the store is they have bulk um, nuts and seeds and herbs and spices and teas and things. So you can kind of put together your own little mix that you like. And it's wonderful for a snack. I have um, a bag of nuts in my bag that I carry with me. And I usually also have one in the car because at any moment I might be hungry and I need to know that there's a healthy snack I can grab. Um, carrots and hummus. Look at these carrots. There's so many colors. You can get these at any store nowadays. Um, these rainbow carrots, and they're delicious, and just add some more color and good nutrition. I even have chipotle on here, you guys. I have a bowl of salad with some veggies and guacamole and chicken or whatever your favorite protein and some black beans in there. Um, that, that's actually a way that you could eat out. More of these restaurants are, are offering cauliflower rice as well, which is just cauliflower that's cut up in real small little pieces. So it kind of has the texture of rice, but it's all vegetables. And that's a great thing to include when we're talking about a low sugar, low carb, and a, a weight loss type of a diet. And then for dinner, it could be wild salmon. When I look at food diaries, there are two major, well, there's three major things typically missing. One is vegetables. Uh, we should be eating five to six servings at least a day. Um, people are usually eating two to three. We have our one with lunch and two with dinner, if that. Um, so that's one, water and hydration is lacking. And then fish, we don't eat fish very often, let alone the two to three times a week that is promoted um, by organizations like the American Health Association or American Heart Association rather, um, and the Academy of Nutrition. That, that's a really big deal. Why? Because fish provides Fatty fish, wild fish, provides omega-3 fatty acids. You cannot make omega-3. We have to take them in. So if you're not eating wild fish, wild salmon, wild sardines, those are two of the best fish to be eating two to three times a week, you're probably deficient. And that's where you could utilize supplements. Or if you just hate fish, I see that a lot. That's one food that I can't really magically make taste different. Um, so you kind of either love it or hate it. If you're not eating fish, though, you should be supplementing with it um, from an anti-aging and from an inflammation standpoint. Um, there's a purple sweet potato up there. It tastes just like a sweet potato. Um, I make my daughter loves them. Um, I get them at Heinen's. I don't know if that's close to anybody, but they'll have them there or Allison's Superfoods that's in Strongsville if you're local. Um, those are some great stores to get some fun, organic, different in season type of foods like that and really high antioxidants. And we just put some coconut oil and some cinnamon, not cinnamon and sugar, but usually just some cinnamon. And it's a delicious side dish that's now bringing in a lot of nutrition. There's stuffed peppers, you could have olives. Olives, I will um, admit are one of my big addictions. So thankfully I don't have any blood sugar issues because they can be really salty, but that's my go-to snack as well as doing some olives. Um, and then dark chocolate, of course. So there's not a lot of stuff that you would need to cook in a day like this. It's just having these colored foods, these vegetables and things on hand so that we can utilize them. Um, I get nervous whenever weight loss is put, like, and I'm going to be talking about that, that people are going to show up expecting me to have some miracle pill. And guys, if I had one, I would tell Oprah and then she would tell the world because it is something that everyone is so desperate for. 
but it's about this stuff. It is about changing your diet, feeding yourself with nutrition and real foods that your body then goes, oh, I could use this. So I don't have to make you as hungry because you've now gave me actual nutrition instead of empty calories that I have to continuously tell you you're, you need to eat more because I'm not actually getting anything I could use. That's the way it works. And so when I have people, we don't count calories. We don't change anything else except trying to get them more real, get more of these whole foods in. So that is the best place that I can encourage you to start. My second tip for weight loss, as well as blood sugar balance, is to watch your beverages. I hate to see people drinking such high amounts of sugar because it's such a waste. And it is, um, if I could get rid of any one food and, and take it out of our, our lives, it would be soda, hands down, um, because it is a straight shot of sugar to the liver, or it's artificially sweetened, like a Diet Coke or something like that, but it's having an insulin resistance response and causing more issues there, even though it doesn't have the calories and it doesn't have the same sugar. So diet drinks are still not great. Um, it changes your microbiome, but these, these drinks, juices as well, even if it's 100% juice, um, we just don't really need them. It's one thing if you're doing like a tart cherry juice or something for inflammation or for something, that maybe beet juice for your blood pressure or something, but just to have juice in the morning because we think it's healthy, oh, start your day with that orange juice. You've just engaged the roller coaster and orange juice is a, a, a drink that we use when someone goes hypoglycemic, when their sugar goes too low because it shoots it right up. So be really careful, look at your beverages. I would rather someone eat a brownie than drink a soda. Um, honestly, it, it's just, it's just so detrimental, causes non-alcoholic fatty liver issues, it causes insulin resistance, and um, really damaging to our cells. So that's my number two tip. Number three, I know the E word, exercise, nobody wants to hear it, but again, this is not magical stuff, guys. We are moving our bodies less and less. We don't, I used to talk about like, oh, you just go through the drive through you don't even have to get out of your car. Now we don't have to get out of our houses because you could just have food delivered now. And it's like, that's great when you're quarantined, but what kind of choices are we making? And are we just sitting there waiting for the food to show up? We are not using what we have. Our bodies are meant to be exerted and to be used and to continue to be strengthened. And um, exercise is something I have to really forced myself to do. I used to be a runner. I used to be a dancer. I used to love it. And now in my life, it's like, I work a ton. I've got two kids. All of my energy kind of goes with other things. So I had to start making a priority, like 10 minutes. I didn't go to the gym for an hour and a half. I made like a 10 minute time and I got some stuff that I could use in the house. Um, just like a resistant band and things like that, that I can do. And I just made it a priority to just start there. Once you start, you'll almost always go and exceed that, you know, 10 minutes, but we just got to do it. And um, if that's something that's hard for you, that should be your focus. Why am I not doing it? I'm too tired. Okay, well, maybe there's a part in my day that I'm not as tired. How can I fit this in then? Even if it's five minutes. Um, but ideally, we're doing things, not just walking the dog leisurely, but we're getting our heart rate up, we're, we're having trouble carrying on a conversation because we're out of breath, we're sweating. That's the type of movement we need to be getting in as much as you possibly can. What's the magical number? It's as much as you can do and then try to do more, honestly, because it's so important and it goes right along with all of these changes. Exercise helps to reduce blood sugar. It helps your body utilize uh, sugar better. It reduces insulin resistance. It reduces obesity. So again, all of these things that we're connecting and it's anti-aging in and of itself because when we exercise, we create really healthy things like uh, brain-derived neurotropic factor, which helps keep the brain young um, and different, different uh, components. It helps with mood. It's like an anti-anxiety, anti-depression type of thing. So I will stop harping on exercise, but it's just, 
we've got to fight against these excuses. If you've got bad joints, oh, I've got bad knees, I've got bad, swim. You could do chair workouts. You could get a bike. You don't have to get a Peloton and spend thousands of dollars. You can get just a good old fashioned exercise bike. And that will take some of the, the wear and tear off of your joints. So there are definitely things you can do. If you can move your little finger, that's what you should be doing. Little exercises there and just get yourself started. Um, tip four is consider using a meal replacement. This is an easy way that can help you control and like lower calories in a day because most meal replacements, if they're geared towards um, weight management, will be uh, calorie controlled, but they're satisfying. And this is one of my favorites, uh, raw fits that we have at the store. It's got 28 grams of protein. It's high in fiber, um, eight grams of fiber in it. It's got less than a gram of sugar. They do use some stevia in there, which I think is okay just to make it taste good. And you can mix it. I like to mix it um, with like a unsweetened almond milk or unsweetened coconut milk or something. I think it be tastes better that way than with water. Um, but this is a great way to, you know, if you were skipping breakfast or you were someone that was always going through the drive through because you don't have time, you literally put this in with liquid, shake it, and you're out the door. It's a very quick. And, and great with those two keys that help keep blood sugar down and help with weight loss, which are fiber and protein. So it's, and it's all plant-based. So this is organic and plant-based. So I love a product like this. Um, there are other ones too. If you come into the store, there's other products, but Raw Fit, I, I don't know how long it's been around. It's been several years. And I always think like, oh, maybe there'll be one that comes out that's better, but I honestly love this product. They also put in some ashwagandha, which I'm going to talk about a little later when I talk about stress, and um, green coffee extract, which helps with blood sugar. So um, it's a cool product. If you're someone that is, is satisfied by drinking, I do have some people that say like, I need to eat something um, rather than do a uh, shake. And they do make bars. They make protein bars that uh, Mike knows are some of my favorite things. I, I heard a rumor that uh, they were out of stock at one time and I was like buying boxes because there's another one of those things I keep on hand that um, just are a healthier process type of product, all organic. You can understand what every ingredient is to keep my blood sugar stable and to, to satisfy me so I'm not reaching for junk. Let's talk about intermittent fasting. I'm, I'm probably gonna get more into fasting at some of the future series talks, um, but I had to mention it here just because it is another powerful tool for helping with weight loss. Now I'm not talking about abstaining from eating for days on end. I'm talking about intermittently, which maybe is overnight. For me, this works wonderful because the second during the day you tell me I can't eat, I'm immediately hungry, even if I've just eaten and reaching, like I go into like that mentality of like, oh my gosh, where's my, when is my next meal? It's all I'm thinking about. So I like to do this overnight where I stop eating a few hours before bedtime and then I don't eat right away. I was a person that would eat up until bedtime and ate first thing in the morning and I thought I just needed to because my blood sugar tended to drop. I would tend to go hypoglycemic and need something to kind of bring me back up. But since it's been about a little over a year that I've been doing intermittent fasting and um, it's really helped. I feel like I could pop out of bed in the morning. I have people that say they have better mental clarity. Um, the big thing with fasting is it increases autophagy. Autophagy is the removal of kind of like debris and dead tissue because the fat stays in there, those dead cells that aren't really doing anything, it clutters up the system. So this allows your body to detox. It has been closely associated with longevity when people do periods of fasting, whether it's a whole day once a week or they do intermittent fasting. Um, it's part of religious practices. So it's helping you to control calories because you're only eating now in this window. Now I have, that could backfire for some people. So you can't go crazy. It's not like, oh my gosh, okay, it's noon. I could eat from now until 7 p.m. and I go crazy. That's not what we want to do. We want to eat normally. And I really think if you try this, um, is, again, check with your health practitioner, but 
it's a great tool to use to get you kind of to lower overall calories and allow your body to restore and detox and clean out great for the brain and like mental clarity. I feel like I'm, I'm was sharper. Whereas before I would have to eat before I really felt like my brain was working in the morning. So it's a great thing to do. And maybe like a 12 to 14 hour fast overnight. So again, just stopping a couple hours before breakfast or before bedtime, and then maybe waiting an hour or so in the morning, uh, if that works for you. Evening is also when we tend to snack and eat those traditional snack foods. So the chips, the cookies, the ice cream, the, the pretzels and popcorn and all those good things. So, um, you know, that's fasting and, and getting into that routine uh, will help you kind of break that snack cycle as well. Um, I see a question here. Someone is asking about decaf green tea. Is it beneficial? Yes. Green tea has been shown to have benefits for weight loss and inflammation independent of caffeine. So it's okay that it doesn't, caffeine is not the thing that's speeding up the metabolism. It's, it's an antioxidant that's actually in green tea. So you don't have to have a caffeinated green tea. I will say though, get a good quality, get an organic decaf because they tend to use chemicals when they decaffeinate uh, products like teas. Uh, they can be higher pesticides too if you don't get uh, organic. So just something to think about. But yeah, I'm absolutely not a big caffeine person. So I like a decaf green tea, I think it's, it can be very beneficial. Okay. Now, some of you may be sitting there thinking I do all of these things. So I have on, um, on the handout that you get that the, the most important questions that you can ask yourself is going to be, do I have trouble making healthy lifestyle changes? the diet and the exercise stuff? Or am I doing all of these things and I can't lose weight in spite of doing all of those efforts? And that's what I'm gonna talk about next. But be real with yourself, be honest. I, I, it sometimes takes me an hour or so in working with someone before they will admit like, you know what, I really don't exercise at all. I work in an office and I sit there, I just don't have the energy. Okay, then we need to talk about exercise. And that's where we need to focus before we try to look for something that, you know, could be wrong, but it's, it's about something else. So ask yourself that question. Am I having trouble making healthy changes? That's where you should focus. Hook up with a health coach, hook up with a dietitian, someone that, that can really explore that with you and help you fit into your life. Some slow changes just to ease you in that can make a big difference. But if you're truly doing all of those things, there are some inhibitors of weight loss that could be interfering. One of them is thyroid. So having a low functioning thyroid means you have an underactive metabolism. The thyroid is the gland that sits um, kind of around that Adam's apple in your neck. And um, if, you're, if it's under functioning, it's going to be a lot harder to lose and maintain weight. So there's some other symptoms that tend to go with a low functioning thyroid, things like you're very cold, cold extremities, you have a low core body temperature, fatigue and weakness. So you're kind of, no matter how much sleep you get in that point where you're just kind of chronically fatigued, your brain is more sluggish, um, low mood, everything's kind of low with an underactive thyroid. So your mood, more depression type symptoms, um, menstrual irregularities, fertility issues, bowel problems. Many people with underactive thyroid tend to be more constipated. Um, hair and skin changes, hair falling out, hair becoming very thin. Um, that could be a sign of, of other hormones that are involved with aging, but um, it could also be a thyroid issue. Uh, enlargement in the neck could be a sign of like a goiter or, or nodule on a thyroid. So those are all important things to pay attention to. And we're gonna talk about some nutrients that are really important to make sure your thyroid is functioning the way it should be. Um, things like iodine. Iodine is necessary to make thyroid hormones. So you can't make these T3 and T4 hormones without iodine. Selenium, selenium is uh, necessary for converting the hormone T4 into T3. I'm trying not to get too technical, but you know, it's important. Um, just so that you have that active hormone to use. So we need selenium. Um, Google 
ginseng. Those are other helpful things that you can supplement with ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is good for stress that we'll talk about. It's also good for the thyroid. So there are things that you can do to help support a low functioning thyroid. Um, or sometimes I have clients that are already on maybe like Synthroid, but still feel like their thyroid's not functioning properly. And that's because Synthroid is T4. Your body may not be converting that into that active T3 hormone. So maybe you need to either ask your doctor to add in some T3 or add in a supplement that could allow and help with that conversion. Because there's a lot that's, that are, you know, that's going on. Um, just like with blood sugar, I didn't make a slide for it and I should have, but I'm just thinking of it now. There are some uh, tests that your doctor can do beyond just testing TSH. So they can test for your actual T3, they can test for T4, and then they could test to see if you have an autoimmune related thyroid issue, which actually is treated different. So um, I just wanted to mention thyroid because that can be a big inhibitor when someone is really trying to lose weight. What's the other one? Stress. Who's not stressed? You know, this past year was very trying for a lot of us and flipped our whole world upside down, literally. And um, that kind of it was very stressful. But even before that, we just live these lifestyles that are constant in motion. And, you know, on top of things like money problems and, um, you know, car problems and working too much and, and getting in arguments with a spouse or someone else in the family. Like, there's a lot of stressors going on that we just constantly deal with. And you may say like, I'm not stressed. I deal with those fine. But internally, as you're dealing with them, there's a whole cortisol and hormone firestorm happening that's saying, hey, I'm in starvation mode. I'm in fight or flight mode. Hold on to all these calories. And that will affect blood sugar as well. I mentioned cortisol and blood sugar in the beginning. So again, we're adding into that cycle. Now stress is playing a role. So, you know, there's something called adrenal fatigue is kind of like an older term. Uh, we, we really call it HPA access dysfunction because it has to do with the hypothalamus, the pituitary and the adrenals. Um, that are all involved in this process. And this isn't really something that a doctor typically will diagnose. You'd, you'd wanna go to more of a functional medicine practitioner. Um, if you're having trouble getting up in the morning, maybe you're having like that tired but wired feeling at night where you feel exhausted, but your mind's going. Um, craving salty foods, inability to handle stress. You get more irritable, you're kind of on edge. Um, higher energy levels in the evening. If you're using stimulants like caffeine, you're doing three, four cups of coffee and really relying on that to keep you up. If you get sick often, that's a sign that stress is at, at play where you're getting sick more often than you should because stress support, uh, suppresses the immune system. So this is another big thing that should be explored. If you are making all those healthy changes, you're working out like crazy, the weight won't budge, look at your stress levels and see if there are things that you can do to help to manage stress. Um, so what can you do? I have this on the handout. You can do some deep breathing exercises. There's one I really like. Well, there's a couple I like. One is called box breathing. And this is an easy one to remember because just think of the four sides of the box and you basically pick a number and most people start with the number four or five. So you inhale for four, you hold for four, you exhale for four, and then you hold it out for four. So it creates this box. And you do that several times in a row. And the counting in your mind helps redirect your brain towards, uh, you know, refocuses, gets you out of that negative kind of headspace. And then the breathing actually just like sends signals to everything to just kind of slow down. How many times a day are you taking moments to just breathe? and just be present. Even if you don't do the fancy box breathing and count, just breathe deeply, breathe into your belly and take moments as many as you can during the day. Breathing is free, right? This is a technique that is free. Any, you can do it anywhere you are and it makes a huge, huge difference. The more you do it, the better it gets. This is, and, and even immediately if you're super stressed, do some breathing. Your, your entire system will thank you. Um, there are also supplements and, and herbals that you can do. Holy basil and ashwagandha are two adaptogenic herbs. That adaptogenic means that they are helping with the stress response. So 
sometimes I'm talking to someone in the store and they're telling me they came in for weight loss and they're expecting me to give them some weight loss stimulant. And in talking with them, they're, they're, you know, really busy and they're working. They've got a lot going on and they're taking care of a parent and they're like, and I, I say like, can we address this first? I know you might be in a hurry to lose weight, but this is not going to happen correctly if you don't take care of the stress issue first. So it's really something to pay attention to and, um, and really uh, work on. So again, we have that question, do I have trouble making lifestyle changes or do I have trouble losing weight even with those changes? So, um, so that's an important thing. We see a question here, someone is asking, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the exact trigger relationship between stress and salty foods? So I believe it just has to do with the fact that you are, um, it's like a uh, system cue to, to get more sodium in. You have those cravings for more sodium, thinking that these are foods that are going to be important to kind of keep that energy up and keep you going. Um, so I don't know exactly the mechanism in the body that's kind of cueing that up. But it is a very, very common thing that I will see. Insulin resistance tends to be more about the sugar cravings and weight loss is more about sugar. But in the, in the case of stress, we see more cravings for saltier foods. Um, what were the two items you suggested to relieve stress? So the supplements I said were holy basil. It's also known as Tulsi. You can get it in a tea. We have it in a capsule. We have it in, uh, you know, many different formulas that it's a part of. Um, but holy basil is one of my favorite. And then ashwagandha. So that is uh, um, another very traditional Ayurvedic herb that helps to balance that cortisol. All right, let's talk about supplements lastly. So these are just, in everything I'm talking about, I wanted to just pick some supplements that I thought might be good to, you know, bridge that gap and break that cycle. The first one is PGX. This is a fiber product that, um, if, if you've heard of psyllium, PGX is like psyllium on steroids. It's seven times as viscous, like it thickens seven times as much as psyllium. Um, it's a really potent, soluble fiber. So this is good for cholesterol. This is good for blood sugar. This is also good to keep you feeling full, to help with appetite control and help with craving. So I say that, but this is a very physical, um, like if you're feeling hungry a lot, you never feel full. Um, or maybe you're, you're having blood sugar is issues where you need something to help it become more stable. And that's when you would take PGX. You could start slow with it because it is a fiber. Um, I like to start people on one or two. I had a friend start with nine a day. Don't do that. She said, what's wrong? I feel like my appendix is going to rupture. I said, that's not your appendix. That's your, <laughs> that's your stomach and your intestines telling you that you're too, there's too much fiber going on. Um, so start with one or two, and then you could utilize them to whenever you kind of feel cravings the most. Are you a nighttime snacker? Take a couple PGX before dinner, maybe take one with, with some uh, healthier protein snack at night, and that should help get you through and, and keep that blood sugar more stable. It's a great product. Make sure you're drinking enough water with any fiber, but I love that stuff to really slow down the absorption of, of uh, carbs. And this is a, uh, it's like, something on the track so it's not letting that roller coaster go up as high um, so it's a great product along with that is one of my probably most recommended products when someone is pre-diabetic or borderline or knows they have a blood sugar issue this product is a complex that has multiple ingredients that work together to help increase insulin sensitivity and support healthy blood sugar. I have to say it as support healthy blood sugar rather than lowers blood sugar, just from a, a you know, practitioner standpoint, but I've seen people's numbers go down that are testing. And I love this product for someone that's in that borderline or insulin resistant state that really needs some support. This has chromium in it, which is a mineral that is critical for 
uh, keeping cells responsive to insulin. It's got Gymnema sylvestra, which is another herb that is great for um, sugar management. It has alpha lipoic acid, which is a universal antioxidant to support anti-aging and, and uh, the extremities to keep your, your nerves and all your cells really healthy. So that's a great product that you would take. Um, I believe it's a three a day, like one before each meal, or I have some people that just do it with their biggest meal and it should help to kind of curb that, that sugar spike as well. That's a great, great product. Um, if you're just thinking about metabolism and weight loss, I like the Life Extension Mega Green Tea. This is not, um, this is, has a little bit of caffeine, but it's lightly caffeinated. It's just what's naturally occurring in the green tea. So it's no more than like drinking a cup of green tea, maybe about 40 milligrams or so. Um, got a lot of polyphenols in it. Green tea has EGCG in it. This is a, a compound that is really something that drives the metabolism up. I say that this is not magical where you're just going to take this and do nothing else and drop 25 pounds. These supplements don't work like this, but this can give you a little boost. I encourage people to take it in between breakfast and lunch just because there was a little bit of caffeine in there, but it works really well in between meals to kind of drive to keep that metabolism going. But it, green tea is so good for a lot of other things. You can drink it. If you're drinking it, you want to drink like three, four cups to really see a metabolism boost. Um, or one of these pills. Uh, this is one of our stronger green tea products that we have at the store, and um, I love it. And then I wanted to put something on here for thyroid support, because this is another place, another inhibitor of weight loss efforts. And this is a great product that if you are underactive, this is not for someone that is overactive with their thyroid for someone underactive, it's got the iodine, it's got the selenium, it's got a lot of the other support ashwagandha is in there. So it addresses the adrenals a little bit and stress response as well as thyroid. Um, so really, I, I, I love Mega Foods products. Um, I take their, I don't have a thyroid issue, but I take their adrenal strength. I've been on it forever. And uh, it's one of the ways that I keep my cortisol balanced and, and keep that stress response low and love it. So if you, if you, feel like you have a lot of symptoms of low thyroid or you've been, right? This can be something you can think about maybe adding in uh, first thing in the morning or something like that to really address both the thyroid, which then engages the metabolism as well as the stress response. So very different in how each of those supplements work. So you can kind of think about like, well, which one is it more of a meal replacement like the raw fit I talked about? Do I just get hungry a lot and I need something to slow that blood sugar spike? That would be more PGX. You've got a known blood sugar issue, borderline. You've been told you're pre-diabetic, anything like that. That would be glucose support. For metabolism, it would be the green tea and then thyroid strength if it's a thyroid issue. Um, someone's writing, I often feel really sleepy after dinner. Is this related to blood sugar? It could be. Absolutely, it could be. Um, if you're getting enough sleep, and you're getting good quality sleep, then probably there's something else going on where you're having a crash. Think about what you're eating at dinner. Are you eating a meal that is spiking your sugar up or is not giving you enough nutrition? Um, are you not eating enough earlier in the day or are you eating too much at once? And then, you know, you can kind of evaluate, is it my meal? Am I just not sleeping anyway? So I'm just tired at that time. And you might have to dig a little deeper to really think. Um, would thyroid strength work well with Hashimoto's and taking Cytomel medication for Hashimoto's? Um, I would just consult your practitioner. I do have a lot of clients that take thyroid strength along with their medication, but Hashimoto's is an autoimmune. So really you should be working to address gut issues and getting off gluten, getting off high allergen type foods. Um, dairy and gluten are two of the big ones um, because Hashimoto's is not a thyroid issue. It's an issue of the immune system. It's an immune response that's attacking the thyroid. So um, I just feel like that's such a underdiagnosed. I'm glad you got a diagnosis because it's overlooked all the time and it needs to be treated differently. So if you're still feeling a lot of symptoms of low thyroid or it's swinging back and forth, 
healing the gut and addressing food, nutrition, cleaning up the diet, that's going to actually be better probably and make a bigger difference for you than just adding in a supplement. So thank you for that question. Um, I see someone else is um, talking about some of her medical history, talking about working out a lot, drinking lots of water, but continuing to gain weight. I have a stressful job. Um, and then the endocrinologist keeps on increasing or decreasing medication. Nothing's changing. Yeah, medications are not always the answer if other things aren't changing. If you have this burden of stress, so your system is in constant like go, go, go mode, then medication typically is not going to change that. Uh, so if you have PCOS, you have insulin resistance, I can almost guarantee, I almost always see those two hand in hand. So it's about um, maybe doing a more extreme diet possibly, work with your practitioner, but maybe you're someone that needs to do more of like a ketogenic type diet or an elimination diet where you're, you're kind of allowing your system to come back into balance. And then we can work with, you know, you can work with supplements. I know you wrote, you're hoping to get connected with a naturopath. Um, for help and support. I think that's a great idea. There are more naturopaths and there are more functional medicine practitioners popping up every day. So I, I highly encourage it because they're, they're looking at whole body. They're looking at all these different things, not just the one piece that every different doctor, you know, we've got a doctor for this part of us, a doctor for that part of us, but are they talking? Are they connecting? Are they looking at you as a person and really digging deep to see what's going on? So I think that's a good direction for you is to look, look into a naturopath or a functional medicine practitioner. Someone else is asking, are you familiar with the diabetes chat room to post questions and answers to? I am not. Um, but I can do some digging for you and, and see if I can get an answer. Um, nothing is, is popping up off the top of my head that, that I can think of, but I am sure they exist and support groups are everything. Having support, such a key. Um, can you take more than one of these supplements together? You can. PGS is a fiber, so it's going to slow down things. So I would not necessarily take your supplements with PGS. Um, but the other supplements, you can, you can definitely combine some things. There's really not a lot working against each other, but introduce them one at a time. You never want to just introduce three supplements that are new because you won't really know what's working, what could be not working for you. Um, I'm concerned about my thyroid being vegan. Do you find vegans have low thyroid? No, I don't. I don't really see a connection, um, especially if someone's eating a vegan diet with tons of vegetables and see, you know, seaweeds and, and good quality greens. Um, you can be vegan and have a, a good thyroid healthy diet. Um, you may need to be vegan and gluten free um, or just making sure you're getting low processed foods. Sometimes soy can be a problem. So if you're a vegan that's eating a ton of soy foods, then I would say you may have to back off a little bit just because soy can sometimes pose a problem with thyroid issues. So don't do a ton of like tofu and processed soy foods. Someone's writing, I take metamucil. Can I also take it with PGS? You can. I would say if you're taking PGS, you probably could get off of the metamucil. PGS, in my opinion, is a superior fiber to um, acillium, which is what metamucil is. And it also, check out those other ingredients on your metamucil. If it's a flavored Metamucil, it's got a lot of dyes and junk in there. So just be really careful with that. Okay. So lastly, I know I'm over. I'm sorry, guys. Um, I just wanted to talk real quick about our men mental state. And um, everyone knows eating vegetables are good for us. Everyone knows they should drink more water and exercise, but we're not doing it. Why aren't we doing it? Um, it can be more stressful often to, to make these changes. So I try to encourage people to not make it about weight. If weight was enough of a motivator to make changes, we'd all be thin because it would be that easy. Weight is not a motivator that usually helps, gives people enough of that drive and enough of that motivation that they can stick with changes. We need to look elsewhere. We need to celebrate victories that aren't looking at pounds lost. 
focus on improvements in your joint health and inflammation. You probably feel better. Your energy levels will go up. Your labs will improve. Your clothing fits different. Um, so I very rarely weigh my clients even because unless that's something that they really want to pay attention to, because I don't care about pounds on the scale. I care about inside. Are you making more muscle? Are you feeling better? Think about fitness, thinking about all the things you can do. I had someone tell me um, the other day that she can get down and do a puzzle with her grandkids. And to her, that was the thing. If she didn't care how many pounds she lost. And I thought that was such a great win for her that she had been making so many efforts that that was something that, that was a, a big result, a huge win for her. Um, we've got to think about our relationship with food. Food is meant to fuel us, not to feed into our emotions. And so if you're an emotional eater, that's where you start. That's where you've got to get serious and look at that first. And have support. Everything's easier with a partner, with a friend, with a team, um, someone that's going through things with you, even if they're not doing the same you know, diet and exercise program you are, um, at, at least having an outlet and someone that can be there and someone that's not going to sabotage your efforts and stuff the cabinets with some of those processed foods that we don't want to have. Okay, so thank you, everyone. I know I'm, I'm like so over. I, I, this is a lot to talk about in one talk, but if we work on our blood sugar, if we manage our weight, this is a way that we can really push back against aging. So I thank you everyone for your time and I really appreciate uh, you being here. Thanks, Nicole. That was really good. Hi, everybody. I'm back. Thank you so much for sticking with us. Um, if you had to leave, well, you wouldn't be hearing this, but if you, we are recording this. <laughs> no worries. Uh, if you have to, if you have to go, we're just going to wrap up real quick. I did want to tell everybody um, that if you had any last minute questions, I see there are some coming in. Go ahead and keep submitting for the next couple seconds. I'll take a note uh, and then we'll try to post those on the web page. Um, so again, thanks very much. And I I like sprouted breads. I think they're great. Um, it's important to note that breads like Ezekiel, even though they're sprouted and don't contain wheat, they contain spelt and some other gluten containing grains. So just for those that don't do gluten, I just wanted to mention that Ezekiel may not be the best for you, but I definitely, I love sprouted nuts and seeds. I think sprouted breads are much more healthful because when you sprout a food, you increase the nutrition, they tend to be better digested and uh, easier on the system. So yeah, I think if you're gonna do a bread, make it a sprouted bread and, um, or I found one too that is all like, it's like almond flour and it's got some eggs in it and flaxseed and it's by base culture. It's a keto bread actually, but that has become, I can't do, cause I can't do gluten or else I would do my Ezekiel bread. Um, but that's another one that, that is great. And maybe Mike, we should think about carrying that one at the store too. That would be a good one. I think <laughs> yeah, so sometimes these things aren't available to us, but I'll have to find out where you got it and then we'll look into it. So thanks. Yes, okay. So yes. thanks again, thanks again, everybody. Thank you, Nicole. And, and again, keep your eye out for the email, for the, the survey afterwards, the little code, and thank you for attending. And again, this recording will be on our website probably tomorrow. So if you missed anything or you had to step away, you'll be able to revisit it. So thanks again. And thanks, Nicole. Take care. Have a good night, everyone. Good night.